Lecture 14, November 17th. Welcome to November 17th, Lecture 14th. Um, today, uh, you have uh, one assignment which is due at the moment, uh, which is uh, Wednesday night, the 19th, at 11.45 p.m., which is your updated, this is the binding version of your final project proposal. Uh, again, I, I will be on, you know, you can come by office hours today, or I will be online late latest tonight uh, if you want or and latest tomorrow night if you want to Skype or Google Hangouts if you want to do office hours virtual office hours that's fine the latest means like starting around 10 p.m. so if you want to meet after 10 p.m. then send me send me email okay so today um, actually this is not updated today we're actually going to start we're going to sort of finish up on the beta free energy approximation the beta entropy approximation talk about something called loop series um, correction or loop series approximation, which is in some sense a way of going between the approximation and the truth. And then we're going to start on uh, the more general form of this, which is a, a hypertree variant of the beta entropy ap approach. Um, now, uh, this is a review. So this is a good time to ask questions if anything's not clear, because if the review is not clear, then it's going to be very hard to follow. Today's uh, a little bit of a technical Lecture. We're not going to go through it in as much detail. What I'm going to hopefully do is impart, uh, at least attempt to impart uh, a strong intuition as to at least the idea of what's going on. So, um, so if you remember, um, what we've been talking about is uh, these exponential family models. And we have the idea that we could either start from the mean parameters and we want to infer the canonical parameters in what's referred to as either the maximum entropy problem or the maximum likelihood problem. Or alternatively, we could say start from the canonical parameters theta and, and try to infer the mean parameters. And we saw that the mean parameters live within this mean space, this convex region, which in some, some cases actually corresponds precisely to the probabilities that we want. For example, in the case of the, of the overcomplete representation, and we have um, statistics corresponding to the indicator functions of every singleton variable and pair of variables along an edge in a graph, uh, then what we get, the mean parameters correspond to the actual marginals that we're interested in, namely the marginals across uh, each individual node, which are the probabilities of, of those nodes, and, or the, the marginals across an edge. And we also saw a very interesting um, correspondence between the maximum likelihood problem and the conjugate dual. And uh, this is interesting because it gives us an avenue to um, explore approximation because we can actually start taking the dual of the dual. Um, and in particular, we also saw that the dual at the dual value at mu, at the, at the corresponding value theta, so if we were to plug theta in to this expression here, the one that actually achieves <coughs> the maximum or achieves the soup, then that, that actually corresponds to the negative of the entropy of the distribution when it is the case that the mean parameter is um, in the mean space. And uh, this then gives us all these avenues for approximation. So here's the actual theorem that we proved. So here's the expression of the dual. And here's the dual of the dual. And the dual basically says that it's the negative entropy if we're, we have a true mean parameter, and otherwise it's positive infinity. But we also have this expression for the log partition function, equation 14.4, which right away says, if we zoom in a little bit on this, it says, oh, look, we can essentially approximate either here or approximate there, or both. And that's essentially what we're going to be doing all today. That's what we did last time with the beta, the beta entropy approximation and the, and the tree outer bound, or what's called the local consistency polytope. 
Um, but there are lots of variants of this. And what's interesting, in, in fact, somewhat amazing, is that a large number of different approximate inference strategies for graphical models correspond to this approach, where you essentially take either an outer or an inner bound on the mean parameter space or the mean polytope or marginal polytope in the discrete case, in the overcomplete discrete case, and we take various entropy approximations uh, to A star. And then the, the point at which everything occurs, you know, where, where everything matches, is this bottom point here. This is the moment matching condition where we take either the canonical parameters theta that are such that the expected value of the statistics equals the mean, or we find the mean that uh, is of the expected value according to the canonical parameters. So um, we talked about good news and bad news. So here's the, um, the dual of the dual, which gives us back our log partition function. Um, by computing the log partition function, we're solving the inference problem. So if you can somehow solve this, if you can actually find this, the supremum, then we can actually solve the inference problem that we're interested in solving. And, and it also should be clear that when you look at the dual, the, the convex dual, even if it's the case that the original problem is not convex, the dual is going to be convex. Why? Because it's a supremum of a bunch of um, you know, affine functions. And that's always a convex function. And so therefore, the dual of the dual is also a convex function. And, uh, and you might think that this is, since this is convex optimization, it's easy. But in fact, it's not. Because m, in general, is quite complicated to characterize. And also, we don't actually have a closed form, easily easy to evaluate expression for a star. But on the other hand, if we approximate these things, maybe we do get that. So like we might relax m, making it less complex, or relax a star, making it also less complex. And, and what, what I find, and I think I mentioned this last time, amazing, is that this actually, uh, this approach, when we look at the, the Lagrangian form of the optimization, essentially gives us exactly the loopy leaf propagation messages at, at, at a point of convergence. And so this basically, again, gives us all these different methods, some of which we will cover. This is still review. One of which was the, um, so one form of, um, so we define the notion of an outer bound. So an outer bound of the marginal polytope is a set that contains M. And you could form it from a subset of the inequalities. And one form of outer bound is this idea of a local, local consistency along, along edges. So local consistency, first of all, says that these, these sort of pseudo marginals, which is what we're calling them, are, on a, you know, first of all, they need to be non-negative. They need to sum to one uh, as a singleton. And they need to um, match the marginal conditions along the edge. Now, this is really important, right? Because this, for the following reasons, because we're going to generalize this idea. So what we're doing, we've got this graph, right? This is not necessarily a tree graph, right? All we're saying is that, you know, so we have a marginal, a singleton marginal at, let's, let's say these yellow points. And we have a yellow, uh, and we have a pairwise marginal at these purple edges, right? And what we're saying is that if we take any of the purple edges pairwise function and we sum out one of the variables, we're going to equal the marginal that lives at the corresponding node that we've summed down to. <coughs> and this has to exist on both directions along every edge. So in other words, if we were to, zooming in on the, on the upper left, if we were to marginalize either this way or this way, we would get either this marginal or this marginal. And similarly for all of these other edges, no matter which direction we marginalize, we would get the corresponding marginal. This is what tree-based tree, tree -based marginal, uh, tree, uh, the tree-based outer bound polytope means. It's, it's tree-based because it's, it's the conditions that are required for consistency on a tree, and we're then applying it to potentially non-tree graphs. In the case of a tree graph, we know it's uh, correct because we've already gone through the first quarter, first half of this course on uh, talking about tree consistencies and junction tree consistencies. And local consistency implies global consistency. So we defined um, this, um, the locally consistent polytope, or the tree polytope, tree-based polytope, as L of G. And it's based on a graph, and the graph need not be a tree. Um, and the reason why it's an outer bound, why is it an outer bound? Because, well, if it is, if, if these things are true marginals, so any, any set of means inside of M, the marginal polytope, must be real marginals. And so any real marginal would satisfy the local consistency constraint. So therefore, 
and we saw an example last time of locally consistent marginals, which weren't a valid globally consistent marginal. And so therefore, we have this relationship that it's, a, it's an outer bound. And in the case of a tree, it's exact. And we also saw, like I said just a second ago, there are examples where it's strictly larger. Um, okay, so then that's the polyhedral approximation. A, a entropic approximation is again to sort of find solace within the comfort of a tree, which basically says that we can take a tree distribution, like in the, in the case of a tree distribution, we actually have this, right? And in the case of a tree distribution, what we have are, we have the expression uh, of the negative dual, which is the entropy, which can be written in this way. There's, there's a couple of different ways of writing it, we saw. And these things are very, very easy to compute, because they only involve inference over pairwise functions, right? So that's an easy thing to compute. And we get this approximation, hopefully, which is here. Um, we start with this. This is the original one. The approximation is the following. It's the beta approximation to the log partition function. And there's two things, as I said, that we do here. There's either there's this and there's this. Those are the two things that we've approximated. And, gen and again, that's the, that's the name of the game for today's lecture and, la and tomorrow's lecture, is how do you choose the approximation of this and how do you choose the approximation of that. And in the case of, um, of, of these things, that we've just approximated, we have, uh, here's, the, here's the expression where we've substituted in the expression of the entropy. But now, the entropy is not with respect to a tree, it's with respect to an arbitrary graph. So there's the entropy. And uh, we're just basically summing up all of the singleton entropies and subtracting off the mutual informations for all of the edges. Kay. And then the theorem, the important theorem, the interesting and remarkable theorem was that when you sort of solve equation 14.2, one six, and you construct the Lagrangian, and, and you find a fixed point of this Lagrangian, and you look at the Lagrange multipliers, that the Lagrange multipliers correspond precisely to the form of messages that we were sent using the loopy belief propagation, and that basically corresponds. If it's the case that loopy belief propagation converges, we have it the case that that actually is a way of finding a, a fixed point of the Lagrangian. So it's a stable point of the Lagrangian, which is which is good. So it's a, it, it, you know, stable point means it could be a saddle point or something. It's not necessarily an optimum. It's not a convex problem. So we're not guaranteed anything uh, like, like a quality guarantee or quality assurance in general. But on, on the other hand, it sort of puts loopy belief propagation, which you know, we motivated from a very, very different perspective from, again, like I said, the elimination process. And we just did essentially elimination, sort of a loopy form of elimination, which is the, loopy, the message passing. And we found that that corresponds to the Lagrangian optimization problem, which is really uh, neat. OK, so that's the review. Now the question is, you might say, w let's try to get some handle on, on how good this approximation might be. Like, um, so the, um, this, this is sort of the bad region, right? It's the part in the uh, local consistency polytope, not in the marginal polytope. And any point we have in there essentially will be essentially a set of means that are locally consistent, so they'll satisfy the constraints that we want, you know, the local consistency constraints, which is the relaxation of the polytope. But they won't be a true marginal, so we'll, we know for sure that if we are in that set, then we don't have the right marginals. And so the question is, uh, well, if we, if we look at the variational problem, the Lagrangian for form, maybe th that's not susceptible <coughs> to this problem. And uh, the answer is, unfortunately, um, that's not true. And in fact, we can take any point, if you take any point in L, then there is some probability distribution. Th these are all sort of in the family of the graphical model corresponding to you know, this edge set that we're defining things on. So we've got this family of probability distributions. In, um, you know, so we have P sub theta in the family of G and you know, the Markov properties according to F. There is some probability distribution in the family corresponding to G such that um, we can just take some locally consistent marginals and that can be 
uh, a fixed point of loop de belief propagation. Namely, what this means is that any, any point in L is such that we can find a distribution such that that point in L is the fixed point of LBP. So that's, that's not good. It basically means that there's no hope for LBP. And, and even worse, that's also true for the Lagrangian. So it's not like you can say, let's run loopy belief propagation for a while, wait till it converges, and then take the warm start solution, feed it to the Lagrangian, finish up with a little bit of Lagrangian optimization. That's not going to work. That's what this says. So bad news. This is a smi uh, an unhappy face for those who are blind like me. But you probably can't see them when it's at this point. So I was inspired by LaTeX facial expressions at one point. So, so um, now the idea again is is sort of reparameterization of the potential functions, and in the tree case we can reparameter. You know, we start with these potential functions that m are not marginals, and we send messages around in such a way that we reparameterize the distribution without actually changing the distribution, but we're reparameterizing re it in the sense that the values that live at each one of these potential functions is different individually for each potential function, but then when you group them and, and, and agglomerate them all together in the expression of, say, for example, like in the tree case, where you take the product of the edges divided by the product of the, of the nodes raised up to the shadowing coefficient minus 1 or the degree minus 1, that's, you know, you're just reparameterizing by changing the values, but you don't actually change that expression of the numerator and denominator. Now, what we might hope for is maybe there's some sort of reparameterization that sort of maintains something sensible in this case as well. So we know that in the case when we've got a graph with cycles, it's not possible in general to reparameterize um, the distribution so that the potential functions are marginals and, and use exactly the same expression. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, if we do get a fixed point of loopy belief propagation, we don't get a marginal representation, but it does get something that, you know, once normalized, at least still preserves the, um, the original distribution. And, and th here's what we mean by this. Um, what we mean is that, let's say, let's look at the, um, let's look at this right-hand side here. So here's essentially the expression. Um, <coughs> so first of all, note that this is the expression, the thing I just highlighted in green, if it was the case that the tau's were locally consistent marginals and this was a tree, this would be an expression for the probability distribution. Right? So we, it's possible to have local, local consistency, local marginalization, mar, you know, agreement of marginals at, at, at the local level, and we actually have a, a valid expression for this, even without, without this stuff here, without any normalization constant. Okay, that's in the tree case. What we're saying now is that in the non-tree case, we're still using the expression in the sense that we've got, you know, the product over the unaries and the product over the edges of the ratios of the pairs to the corresponding two unaries. Except that what's different here, of course, is that now it's not just a tree, it's actually um, the edges of a graph, of an arbitrary graph, which can be loopy, right? So that's different. So what we've said before is that just that green stuff alone, if it's a, if it's a non-tree, it's impossible to ever set the taus such that the taus are true marginals and also have an expression that gives us uh, the original distribution here. But what this theorem states is the following. It says, well, suppose you found a fixed point of LBP, okay, and say the tau stars are the fixed points of the LBP. So then what it's saying is that if you form this expression, you know, this green stuff again, that's not going to be the distribution, but if we normalize it, it's going to give us a distribution, first of all, right? I mean, obviously, if you take anything that's non-negative and you normalize, and non-negative and non-infinite, and you normalize, it's going to be a distribution, right? It's going to be some sort of probability distribution. The question is, what distribution is it going to be? And what the theorem says that if you normalize it, it it's actually still going to be the same distribution, which is maybe super cool. I wouldn't call it super cool. I would call it m medial cool. You know, it basically says that something has been preserved. Now, of course, normalizing it is not really a useful thing to do because that's sort of, in some sense, as difficult as the original problem, right? That's sort of like computing the partition function. But at least it's proportional. You know, if you put all this stuff together, at least it's proportional to the distribution. 
And so maybe you know, ranks are preserved. Ranks of hypotheses are, are preserved. And if that's, if that's what you care about, you know, but on the other hand, maybe ranks don't, you know, that's not going to help you at all, because if you had the original distribution, the original parameterization, it would have the ranks. But more importantly, maybe if we can somehow estimate this quantity, maybe we can sort of see how bad we're doing. Okay, so let's repeat the following slide from <coughs> lecture 13. But before we do that, before we repeat the slide from lecture 13, are there any questions on this? Any questions on the big picture? Because like I said, there are a lot of, um, it, it, the point of this lecture hopefully is to sort of get some of the concepts through. We're not going to be going through all the proofs, because otherwise we would never, we'd never finish the class. But the proofs are in the book. Any question? Well, so we could have, we could certainly have, let's see, a tau star equal to one, even when the pseudo marginals are way off of real marginals, right? I think that would be really weird. But yeah, I mean, we're talking about in the general case. In the general case, it's definitely not equal to one. In the tree case, it's always equal to one. And, in, and you're asking if in the non-tree case, is it possible for it to be one? And I, I, I'm not sure. I think that it probably is possible, but I'm not sure that that's something that's, that's um, well, so like going to be important. Because sometimes it's, consistent, if sometimes it's too large, and sometimes it's too small, then maybe it could be near one, but it's because different parts of the graph are sort of canceling in that factor. That could be. I mean, if it could be near one. And, and obviously, if it's bigger than one or less than one, it will tell you the abound on the true probabilities, for example. Like if it's, if, it's, if it's always, you know, if it's 0.5 or something, then it's showing you that if you use the original thing, it, it sort of gives you a bound. But uh, the problem is that it's hard to compute. You know, that's the, the thing is that it's, it's sort of, it's a, chicken, it's a chicken and egg problem. It's hard to, hard to compute. So here's a, a reminder of what uh, a pseudo marginal is. So remember the pseudo marginals. We defined um, this three cycle. And we said that there were there was marginals that were uniform at the nodes. So so this basically means, for example, mu one of x one is equal to one is equal to one half. And we f we found pairwise potentials that were, you know, locally consistent, but um, that didn't give us a globally consistent set of um, set of uh, of marginals. Right. In some sense, it didn't give us a set of marginals that could possibly come from any probability distribution. And we saw the example of if we let beta, a very simple example is by letting beta approach 0.5 and <coughs> essentially gives you, you know, along one path it says one thing and along another path it says the other thing, which are contradictory. And so, um, so what this is saying is that um, if we, um, if we were to sort of um, find, um, start, start with this, so this is a point in L except for M, right, because it's a pseudo marginal. And if we were to, to initialize the parameters in this way, then if, if we start sending messages, um, then this would be a fixed point of LBP. Right, so the problem is that it's, it's not going to be something that's going to, this, was, this is an example of the problem that we, we talked about before, where it's possible that we can actually get a point in L, not in M, that doesn't change. So if we keep sending messages around this loop, it's going to stay put. So we'll never ever converge to true marginals. So this is an example. Okay, so, um, so here's, um, here's uh, you know, again, the beta variational approach where uh, here's the original log partition function, and here's the uh, beta approximation to it. This is just a review from a couple of slides ago. And um, what we're going to do, um, if you look at, for example, just this and this, like maybe it's possible to somehow get some way of, of correcting for the errors in the, between the di in the difference between the two, like if we could say, well, if, let's say, is there is there a way of coming up with, a, with an expression, say, for a of theta minus a of beta of theta in a way that's 
useful in some way. So, and that's what the idea of the loop series approximation is, where um, it sort of attempts to come up with an expression for this. And the reason why we care about that, we, I mean, we don't expect this, is, this thing is going to be easy to compute. Like, if we had an expression, would this always be tractable to compute? Why would this not be tractable to compute in general? Yeah, because eight, eight of theta. I mean, you might think like the difference might be simplifiable in some way, but that's impossible, right? Because if it's simplifiable, if you can compute a beta and you have a simplified expression for the difference, suddenly you've been able to compute the log partition function and you've proved p is equal to np and you would be very famous and you wouldn't be sitting here in this room or watching me on video. You would be receiving your Nobel Peace Prize, right? Or no something. Um, so what, what, on the other hand, might be possible to do is if we express a, if a you know, log partition function as this plus this other thing, maybe the expression is, is approximable in some reasonable way. So that difference, if we had a, an expression for it, a reasonable expression for it, maybe that would give us some avenues to explore for approximation. Um, and this is exactly the idea of loop se series expansion. So that what we can do is actually we can, we can approximate this difference via a series of graphs, like, interestingly enough, that um, correspond to a form of loops, actually generalized loops. And depending on how many of these graphs we choose to use corresponds to how close an approximation or, how, or the error of the approximation of that difference. Okay. So um, here's, uh, let's talk about um, generalized loops. So we've got a, we've got a graph G, okay? And this is a, just a, a standard graph theoretic notation called uh, uh, you know, vertex or edge-induced subgraphs. So um, whenever you have a graph G and you take a subset of the vertices, you can construct a vertex-induced subgraph by essentially taking the subset of the vertices and taking all edges such that both pairs of vertices incident to the edges lie within the set of vertices. And that's called a vertex-induced subgraph. Sometimes it's just called an induced subgraph. So if you hear the expression, an induced subgraph, that usually means a vertex-induced subgraph. But there's other forms of induced subgraphs. There are things like edge-induced subgraphs, where you know, correspondingly, you choose a set of edges, a subset of the set of edges, and then you choose the set of vertices, the subset of the vertices that are incident to at least one of the edges in the subset of edges that you've chosen. And then you form a new graph, uh, which is the edge-induced subgraph. Uh, here, there's the new graph, and here are the vertices. And, and like I said before, usually this is just something that everyone should be aware of. If you hear the phrase induced subgraph, that basically typically means vertex-induced subgraph when it's not specified. That's just by convention. OK, so now we can define um, the degree of a, of a vertex S within one of these induced, vertex, uh, induced uh, subgraphs, which, um, and we need a little bit of a notation for this. So if we take the degree of S in E tilde, which in this case obviously is an edge-induced subgraph, then it's basically the size of the degree, size of the, of the, the neighbor set in the edge-induced subgraph. So basically it's where this is, basically this delta function is basically this, the set of all neighbors um, according to E prime, or sorry, E, e tilde. So it's in this edge-induced subgraph, g of e tilde. OK, now what is a generalized loop? This is, um, so we know, what a, we know what a loop is, or what a cycle is, right? A cycle is basically a path where, the, where um, uh, somewhere along the path you repeat. You repeat a vertex. And what a generalized loop is basically one where um, no node has degreed 1 in this induced subgraph, in this edge-induced subgraph. So like, if you have a cycle, if you just have a simple cycle, it's clear that the degree of every vertex is 2, right? Um, what uh, this generalized loop is saying is that there's, there are no pendant nodes. There's no leaf nodes. And so anything, any type of graph where there's never a leaf node has to, is a generalized loop. 
because a leaf node would, you know, by definition, have a degree of one. Um, and so here's some examples of generalized loops. Um, if this was the original graph here, these are these are directly out of the book, except for the one on the right. Then all of these are generalized loops. So notice that um, the only thing that you ask for is that the degree is not one, so that you can actually have degree zero. That's fine. And so you see those these guys in the middle here having degree zero. Um, and similarly, that's a generalized loop. This is a generalized loop. But this is not a generalized loop because it has one vertex of degree one. Okay. Okay. So generalized loop. So that includes all regular loops, right? Regular cycles are generalized loops, and and more more things are generalized loop. Uh, yeah, question. Uh, why do you want to include the degrees in the nodes in the definition? Um, well, first of all, um, you can think of um, a single vertex as as a cycle, right? I mean, it's thing like like for example. Um, Remember how we saw that chordal graphs were ones such that there's always an elimination order, an elimination order that, and chordal graphs are kind of like trees. And so, uh, a, a single node is something that can be eliminated without causing any any additional fill-in. Um, a single node certainly doesn't have any. Uh, I mean, it's sort of it's sort of like a one-node cycle. <laughs> I mean, in some strange way. But I think the real reason, the real answer, is that. Uh, it's necessary to get the expression <coughs> that we're about to derive to be equal. Okay, I mean it's sort of by convention normally that you can think of it as a degenerate loop. A single node is a degenerate loop, but maybe not. I don't know. It, but in this particular case, really, it's meant it's done this way to ensure that the equations which we're about to show are equal. Yeah, question. Uh, is there a button to lower the shades? Is there a button to lower the equations? Well, that we talked about that in equation seventeen point three. So that's the same joke I told last time. Yeah, I can lower the shades. Let me pause this. OK, so, um, so let's now start with a um, LBP fixed point, um, say with the icing model. And um, it turns out, and this is, it, it doesn't take too much to show, but basically it corresponds to you know, looking at the definition of, of marginal distributions. Like, for example, the sum of, um, you know, if you have p, p of x, y, and then p of y is equal to the sum over x of p of x, y. And so this, this is basically uh, essentially a parameterization of the unary and the pairwise pseudo-marginals, which satisfy local consistency via this set of values tau sub s for all um, vertices s and tau sub s t for all vertices s t. This is very similar to the, um, the minimal representation. It's parameterizing the overcomplete representation with the minimal representation of the parameters. And the way we get it is by doing this. So this is obviously, you know, there's only, like if you have a binary random variable, there's only two, there's only one number which parameterizes it, which is the probability that's equal to one. And then here, um, you really only need these numbers here. So there's how many numbers are there in that table? Really, how many unique numbers? There's three: t, tau st, tau sub s, and tau sub t, and that's sufficient to characterize. Because again, the, the redundancy is that everything else is one minus those those three guys. So um, so um, in any event, um, so being locally consistent, or in the tree outer bound polytope, is identical to essentially a couple of conditions on tau, namely that, it's n that the singleton and the pairwise are non-zero, that this has to be greater than zero, and that this has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Now we're going to define this edge weight. Now you're going to say, where does this come from? This comes from basically the proof of the theorem we're about to show. But we're sort of defining it out of the blue for right now. But let's just take it as it is and say, OK, this is this edge weight, which is tau st minus tau s tau t divided by you know, the <coughs> denominator, which is clearly written there. But the point is it's an edge weight. It's a weight for every edge st. 
And also what we're doing is we're going to weight the entire graph. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to, if we have a edge-induced subgraph, E tilde, we're going to weight the entire graph based on multiplicatively combining the edge weights of the remaining edges in this edge-induced edge subgraph. Okay? Everybody happy with that? Okay, so we've got our definition of beta. We've got our definition of the edge weight. We've got our definition of a edge-induced subgraph weight. Okay, given armed with this stuff, we've got this theorem, which basically does this, the following. It relates the true log partition function and the beta approximation exactly. So where do we see everything? Well, here's the true log partition function there. And it's saying the true log partition function is equal to the beta approximation plus all of this junk, which you might think is, is awful and terrible. But it's actually not so awful and it's not so terrible. It's actually quite nice and friendly. And um, here's why. Um, whenever there's um, uh, an edge-induced subgraph such that we've got um, a degree one vertex, uh, the inner term uh, vanishes. So, so like for example, if it's the case, let's, let's see if we look if we look at this for a second. So first of all, this this is the um, let's just erase this for a minute. If we look at um, This expression is really the dth order moment, right? Now, whenever d is one, which means that there that the that the degree in the edge-induced subgraph at vertex s is one, then this becomes the expected value according to tau s of x of s minus tau s. But then th that's just going to be that whole thing is going to evaluate to zero, right? And then we're going to multiply all these guys together for all of the s's. And if there's one vertex in the edge-induced subgraph whose degree is 1, then that basically kills off the expression for the entire subgraph. And so what we're doing is we're, here's, here's the graph weight over there that we saw, this, this beta graph weight. And then we have this outer sum, which is summing over all these subsets. And then let's get rid of this stuff. Okay. So the green stuff is basically the product of the, these moments. And whenever there's a degree one vertex in the corresponding sub, subgraph, that's going to kill off that, sub, that, that um, induced subgraph, that edge-induced subgraph. And we're summing in the blue sum, in the outer sum, we're summing over all subsets of edges. But you know, any of them that are not, any of them, any of those edge-induced subgraphs, even though there's an exponential of them, many of them, any of them that have any vertex that has degree 1 is going to get killed off and is going to contribute a score of 0. So that basically means that the only ones that are left are the generalized loops. So then to answer your question, really, Chandra Shekhar, about the, um, the singleton nodes, I mean, that, that's necessary here to make this expression work. So notice that if d is equal to 0, then we've just got a 1. It's, it's OK with that. It's OK with singleton guys. And then the rest of it is log of 1 plus of that stuff. Okay, so basically what's happening is that this whole expression here is really summing over all generalized loops. And so, so it's saying that this gives us an approximation. It's saying, like, we take the beta um, approximation plus log of 1 plus the sum over all generalized loops of this correction factor. And that's the thing. That's that whole thing, all the log of 1 plus all those guys, gives us the correction factor between the beta approximation and the true log partition function. I think we already talked about this. Um, so the generalized loops give the correction. Does that question? Yep. Oh yeah. Could you explain the ind index underneath the sum? Uh, is that null is not a member of E? I, I don't understand. Um, what, yeah, th so what this is saying here, the question is, what does this mean? Whoops. What's going on here? What does this stuff mean here? So all that means is that we take all subsets of E, uh, except for the empty set. So another way of writing this would be, for example, we could take 
uh, let's just write this up here. We could take um, E tilde in uh, 2 to the E, which is the power set of E, but not the empty set. The set with one element which contains the empty set. So 2 to the E is all subs the set of all subsets except for the empty set. So that could, that's an equivalent way of writing that. Does that make, that make sense? Okay. Um, You get any idea? Yeah, we do all sorts of things. I mean, it basically gives us lots of strategies for doing it. We could randomly sample it. We could use, have some distribution over them and sample according to some distribution. It doesn't have to be uniform. It, obviously, it has to be a generalized loop. There has to be some way of doing it. But we could randomly sample subgraphs. And then if we ever find a degree one guy, just don't use them, like do rejection sampling. And just keep doing that until we're happy. So. Um, Let's, let's do the proof sketch of this. I think we have a little bit of time to do this. So um, <coughs> let's assume it, it's an overcomplete parameter representation. <coughs> so that means that there exists parameters such that um, this outer product is equal to C. Um, and I guess, I mean, this is something that the book does. Basically, you can, you can do this for any of, these any of the equivalence classes of parameters. And the reason why you can do this, if you, if you just go back to this expression, this is something that I think, um, where's the expression? Here it is. Here it is. So um, if it's an overcomplete representation, then, then this is going to be a constant, and, and this, this is going to be a constant. So any, any sort of, any, any of these um, theta plus that value that makes the inner product a constant is going to g yield the same difference in equation 14.14 and 14.16. So in both the um, original unapproximated log partition function and in the beta approximation, it's the same. So hopefully we can go back here. Oops. So what we're going to do then is choose a particular parameterization. We're going to choose the one uh, of this form. So it's the parameterization theta tilde, which is log of the um, tau sub s. And remember, this the, sta the theorem states that we're um, at a LBP fixed point. Okay, so we are at an LBP fixed point. This is not true in general, which is at an LBP fixed point. So it means, for example, that we've either solved the Lagrangian or we've ran an LBP enough times and such that we've gotten lucky so that we've achieved an LBP fixed point. So once we've got this parameterization, basically, because of the fact that it's an optimization problem, you can show that the beta approximation at that value theta hat theta tilde is zero. Okay? So that basically means that we only need to show that the resulting um, log partition function takes the following form, which is the, the rest of the stuff that's left over. And we can show, this is again, uh, you know, skipping all of the algebra necessary to do this, that if we look at the expressions on the inside, so this is, remember, this is related to the um, uh, the weight beta, and so this expression here corresponds to uh, 1 plus beta st of this other stuff. So that's essentially the reason for defining beta the way it, we defined it, was to make this expression work at this parameterization. And then similarly, if we get rid of the log by taking the exp of the log partition function, so we just have the partition function, that basically, here's, we get this. This is the definition of the partition function. And so then 
plugging this expression in for this over here, we get this as a, as a version of the log partition, uh, of the partition function, equation 14.11. So then if we, um, again, do some algebra and use the linearity of expectation, we can bring the expectation in a little bit farther. So we have uh, that this is basically the sum over all subsets of 1 plus this sum over the subsets. Uh, and we've got that there. So it's starting to look a little bit closer to what we want. And then in some sense, so like you can think of, I guess, the way of thinking of this is the following, so that um, I sort of skipped this part here. So let you can think of this yellow part as something you're taking the expected value of, and this green part as the probability distribution. So it's like a factorized probability distribution where everything's independent according to that distribution. So you can think of it as like the expected value of, of this yellow part with respect to that factor distribution, gre the green part. And so that's... And then once we sub then what we do is we substitute that expression in for that, and so we have the whole thing being an expected value with respect to that factor distribution, and that's necessary to give us this form because of the independence of this factor distribution. Because there, we can bring the expected value inside of this product here. The it's the, it's the independence, the factor distribution, which allows us to do that. And um, that essentially is the result. So, um, so the other thing to, to note about this again is that if if it's a tree, then it must be the case that um, this whole stuff evaluates to zero, and that that actually is going to be true because there are no generalized loops in a tree, right? In a generalized loop, every single one of those terms is going to be zero. So it's another proof that, or actually, it is a it's a formal proof that the beta approximation and the log partition function, the, the unapproximated log partition function, are the same in the case of a tree. Okay, so I mean, as you're thinking, you know, like sampling, one way it would be to sample from sub, uh, edge induced subgraphs, or to take a particular set of subsets that are that are useful or that are easy to do. Um, the one of the things that it, it doesn't do, it, it doesn't give us an approximation. So it doesn't say, um, like going back to this theorem, what would be nice would be if we could somehow show that this is either strictly positive or strictly negative or something. So that, in which case, we could actually bound the, uh, we could bound the log partition function with a beta approximation. So unfortunately, in the general case, if you have arbitrary potential functions, you can't, at least there's no known bound. But what it is the case uh, is that for attractive potential functions, so attractive potential functions are commonly used in computer vision, and attractive potential functions are also related to submodular potential functions. In some sense, they're NRA um, extensions of submodular functions. And what an attractive potential essentially means and why it's called attractive is basically it says if you're a potential function, you give more emphasis. You sort of desire more that, that values that are neighboring have the same, or, or I should say variables that are neighboring have the same value. Like uh, the reason why it's useful in computer vision is because um, the idea is that these are used as marker for random fields and these pairwise potential functions sort of express um, a prior on nature, which basically says, if you have two neighboring pixels in an image, if you were to take two random, ran, if you were take to take two arbitrary neighboring pixels, you know, either left, right neighboring, up, down neighboring in an image, chances are they're going to be the same value or very close to the same value, or they're going to be the same label. Like if if you take these two neighboring pixels over there, they're both labeled wall, and if we take these two neighboring pixels over there, they're both labeled Chandrasekhar, right? So that's just a property of, of nature. And so attractive potentials are ones that sort of ex express a desire such that things that are close have the same label. And attractive potentials also correspond to a generalization of submodular. And in this particular case, it turns out that when the potentials are attractive, 
you can actually show that um, the beta is lower bounded is a lower bound of the true, which is which is useful. Yep. That just means that it's a continuous in y space. It doesn't mean it's continuous. So we're still talking about discrete y. Um, think about y. If, if by y you mean the labels, I mean we're calling everything x. So x is sort of our labels. We're, we're not really looking at the at the evidence. I mean we're sort of assuming that the evidence has been absorbed into all these other potentials already. So th there's not it's not continuous in the in the va variables. It's just saying that um, if I take two neighboring pixels and I have some potential function on them, right? This is x of s and x of t. It's saying that it it says that it it expresses a preference for x of s and x of t being the same value over them being different values. Like one very simple one would be an indicator function when x of s is equal to x of t and zero else. That would be a form of attractive potential. Okay. So, um, all right. Any questions? We're going to talk, I, I, I'm not really getting into attractive potentials here because we're going to talk a lot about them at the last part of the course when we talk about graph cut based methods for doing inference in, in very high tree with graphical models and move making algorithms. And a lot of them assume uh, either a metricity or some sort of attractiveness uh, property or submodularity associated with the potentials, which then makes a lot of those, um, those algorithms sometimes even exact. So, um, okay, let's take a break and we will come back in a minute. Okay, so um, let's now um, talk about the next part, which is the uh, Kikuchi uh, variational representation. Now, th this I should mention is is actually a very very broad and diverse and powerful set of methods for for approximation. And you know, there there are lots of variants of this method, but again, these are all strategies. What the important thing to realize, if you if you the higher order bit, or the one thing to to realize is that you know, they're, they're all approximations of these two things, okay? Now, what we've done so far to approximate these two things is get our inspiration from, from trees, right? So in the case of a tree, we can essentially say, what is the marginal consistency, what is the sort of minimal marginal consistency requirement for a tree? And that was the local consistency polytope, or the tree outer bound. And that gave us an approximation for M. And then the other thing that we used trees for was, well, if it's a tree, what's the expression of the entropy? And we had this very nice expression of the entropy. And then the approximation is to say, OK, let's just use that same expression and sum over all edges of the graph, even though it's not a tree. And that becomes an approximation for the dual. But there's this whole notion of a generalization of a tree. And in fact, we've already seen it in the form of a junction tree or a k-tree. And what we can do, and this is, this is again the idea, what we can do is the following. We can say, OK, what would the expressions of the polytope be? So like if, if it was, say, a junction tree or a k-tree rather than just a tree. Okay. Now we, we know we can always embed any graph into a junction tree, right, if the, if the tree width is high enough. But maybe, maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe what we can do is just say, OK, if we had some junction tree okay, of some form, we know that in that junction tree, local consistency implies global consistency. So we can come up then with an expression of local consistency on the junction tree. And that could be used to define um, an outer bound polytope. Right? Because if it's not a junction tree, let's say if it's a, remember if it's a graph of cliques, or if it's a graph of clusters. Remember we talked about cluster graphs originally? And we said originally there were, there were these things called cluster graphs, and there's no running intersection property or any consistency or anything. But if it was the case that we started with the consistency requirements that were necessary for a junction tree, which we know if it is a junction tree, gave us global consistency. But if it's just a cluster graph, isn't going to give us uh, global consistency. But at the same time, we could just go ahead and use that outer bound polytope. And that'd be a way of getting an outer bound for M, okay, number one. And then number two, maybe in the case of a junction tree, there's a simplified expression 
for the entropy. So we could, for example, have an expression for the entropy when it's a junction tree. And if it really is a junction tree, then it's going to be an exact expression for the entropy. But if it's not, maybe we could sort of sum over some extra bits so that you know, more edges in this graph, in this, in this junction tree. Uh, and then go, come up with an approximation. And maybe the approximation is better than the beta approximation. And th that's exactly the idea. And then, then what happens is that you get this expression um, and you can th and wh where you have this outer bound in terms of the junction tree and entropy in terms of the junction tree, even though the thing is not a junction tree, so they're not really, the entropy is only an approximation. And we can have a Lagrangian. We can solve the Lagrangian and we look at, look at the Grange multipliers. And we're going to see that those things are messages as well in some other structure, in some structure which we're going to see is going to be a form of hypergraph. So the idea is exactly analogous to what we've just done. The only thing that's different is the mechanism and the algebra. So in some sense, if you understand the beta approximation and you understand that we're doing an outer bound in terms of the local consistency polytope and an entropic bound in terms of the tree-based entropy, then you understand the Kikuchi approach, which is basically saying we're taking an outer bound in terms of local consistency on what would be required in some junction tree and, local cons and, and entropy in what would be required in, in, a, in a junction tree. Now, the other thing that is different about this is the terminological difference between, say, a junction tree and a hypergraph. And we saw before, and we sort of implied before, and I think even stated directly that junction trees and hypergraphs are kind of the same thing. So the way that the book develops is it is in terms of hypergraphs, and so we're going to be doing that here. But there are lots of different ways of doing it. Because <coughs> um, now, all of a sudden, it's not like there's just one tree uh, that has an expression. There's lots and lots of hypergraphs, all of which could potentially be used. And even within the same hypergraph, there are different ways of doing messages on a hypergraph that, that could, be, um, could be ones that correspond if it converges to fixed points of the corresponding Lagrangian. So this thing basically says, is that, does basically everybody get the, the idea of what we're doing? So I think if you get the idea of the Kikuchi approximation, then, that, and that, then you'll be in great shape. Um, raise your hand if you roughly sort of get the idea. Raise your hand if you don't get the idea. Raise your hand if you didn't just raise your hand. <laughs> OK, so what does that mean when you don't raise your hand? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> well, neither do I. So I, I don't know. If you don't know, I don't know. So um, if you have any questions, this is a good chance to ask, because it's going to get a little bit um, more detailed. So, so the question is, you know, why not a K tree, or why not some other junction tree? Junction trees are really just hypertrees which are special cases of hypergraphs. And remember, the hypergraphs, if we had this graph of clusters, that could also be seen as a, as a hypergraph as well. Yep. So do uh, hypertrees satisfy the Rippling property? Thing? Not necessarily. So junction trees satisfy the running intersection property. Okay. So I think we're running out of time. So we'll probably start with this next time. So, so what you should do, so here's your assignment for Wednesday. Read, I believe this is chapter four in the book, and then read the appendix about the Mobius inversion lemma. And what we'll do is we'll start by motivating it again from this inclusion exclusion thing and show, which will be amazing and interesting, how this property allows us to get a really nice uh, approximate form of the entropy in terms of the hypergraph and also a nice outer bound in terms of the hypergraph as well. Okay? All right, I will see you on Wednesday. <coughs>